Welcome to the Property Management Mastermind Show with your host, Brad Larson. Brad owns one of the fastest growing property management companies in San Antonio, Texas. This podcast is for property managers by property managers. You'll hear from industry leading professionals on best practices, new ideas, success stories, and lessons learned. This is your opportunity to learn about the latest industry buzz surrounding property management, as well as tips and strategies to improve your business. First Choice Bank uses state-of-the-art banking technology through their platform with the Concierge Specialty Deposits Group that handles property management relationships. Use your bank account balances to earn credits, which can be used to offset accounting and other third-party accounting-related charges. Work with First Choice Bank, your financial partner that can provide complete relationship banking. To learn more, visit pmbanking.com. Hey everybody, this is Brad Larson. I want to talk to you about a new podcast out there that I would highly recommend called 300 to 3000, how to grow your property management company to scale. One of the hosts is Matthew Whitaker. He's a good friend of mine. I've visited their operation and I really truly respect what GK Houses has done and they are still doing. They are an experts at growing at a fast scale into a large scale business. So expect to hear the real world truth about all the mistakes the company has made growing into it and all the good things they're doing. Again, go to 300 to 3000.com, that's their website and catch them on iTunes, Spotify, and or Stitcher. Look forward to hearing from good things from those guys. Take care. Welcome everybody to another edition of the Property Manager Mastermind Podcast. I'm your host, Brad Larson. And today's guest, I'm interviewing Peter Lohman coming at us from Columbus, Ohio. Not Columbus, Georgia, Fort Benning, Columbus, Ohio, the other Columbus. And so I reached out to Peter recently because he had put out some great information online about alternative security deposits. So he and I had a pretty good conversation a couple of times back and forth via phone. I said, hey, let's do a podcast on this and talk about security deposits, preferred tenant programs, uh, some of the vendors that are out there in the space. And so without further ado, I want to introduce Peter and we can get right into it. Peter, if you can go ahead and give us a few minutes of your time and tell us who you are, what you are. Yeah. So thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. So uh my name is Peter Lohman. I'm here in Columbus, Ohio. I run a company called RL Property Management Group. We manage uh, just a hair under 500 units of residential rentals, mixture of single family and multifamily here in central Ohio. Um, I live here with my wife and daughter, and uh, the business is about eight years old. So I've been doing a little bit. Um, my background before that was actually as an engineer. So Um, I have a degree in electrical engineering and I worked as a control systems engineer for about five years before I jumped into property management full time. So that's kind of the short uh, story of how I wound my way into property management. Good stuff. I'm going to have to fly you down to San Antonio. You can play with my new fifth wheel uh, RV that I just uh, had delivered yesterday. So I'm all excited to be able to go travel this summer uh, to different places in the RV, work from home, you know, work from the nice. RV, do some, do some cool stuff. I'm going to have you come fly in and yeah. wire me up some batteries. Cause you're an electrical engineer. I need some <laughs> batteries hooked up. I'll do what I can. I'm not an All electrician, right. but, uh, but yeah. All right. Crazy tangent. Sorry to interrupt you on that one, but you know, the electrical engineering is very cool because it makes your mind a very methodical, systematic mind that you are very analytical in certain aspects and so the reason I reached out to you, because I really was impressed by some of the posts you put out. And so you've started to do some podcasting, some content creating, uh, some, some video creating, and some of the stuff you're putting out, man, is primo. And I love it all because anything that can elevate the industry is a good thing. Uh, I think we all benefit from it. And I was so impressed by what you did with the analysis of the alternative security deposits that I reached out to you. I said, hey, man, this is great stuff. Uh, let's get on. I shared it onto the Mastermind Facebook group. You know, I just... Yeah, stole it from you, gave you credit and put it out there. I said, Peter's doing some great stuff. And so we reached out, we had a conversation. And so now we're going to dive into some of this to really talk about it because to give everybody the background and then Peter, you can jump in is we've been using a preferred tenant program now since November of 2019. So we're approaching what now 27, 28 months uh, that has gone by and we've been using this preferred tenant program. Uh, I will tell you, we use Obligo and I think they've done a very good job for us. Uh, Mm -hmm. It's a very good vendor. Uh, The only situation or concern that I have is we have only been able to get about a third adoption rate. You know, I had this chat the other day because I'm only getting 32, 33, 34% adoption. So basically one out of three of the incoming applicants are interested in paying a little, a little fraction per month versus a giant security deposit up front. 
And I think it's, it's sort of the trend, but you would think you'd get higher adoption rate because a lot of the apartments have been doing this for years and years. This is kind of what you've found out in your research. So kind of prefacing the conversation a little bit, yeah. kind of dive in and, and jump into kind of what you've discovered in your research. Yeah. So, you know, I've been following the space for years now, just as a passing interest. And I'll say right up front that we don't use any of these companies. I've never used any of these companies. So I felt like I was in a position to give a fairly unbiased sort of assessment of what I could find out about their business models and the pros and cons of each. So I really looked at, you know, this, my interest in it has, has gone back years, but it here recently, I really got interested in it because my local city council um, presented some legislation called renter's choice which makes it essentially forces landlords and property managers to provide tenants with other options besides a normal security deposit. Wow. And so if, if renter's choice legislation passes in your city, you're no longer allowed to charge one full month's rent up front as a security deposit. So the city of Columbus uh, here locally was discussing this and they were having some hearings and I, it came out of nowhere. So I got really you know, concerned and started looking into the details. And so that led me down the path of exploring these different security deposit insurance companies. Um, some of them aren't actually insurance. And so there's, there's actually a lot of detail in uh, important details that differ between the companies in exactly whether it's an insurance or a surety bond or a, a financial product that's neither of those. Um, so I kind of followed along as our city council uh, did eventually end up passing some of that legislation. It goes into effect in July. Um, so starting in July, we'll have to provide tenants the option to pay the security deposit with six monthly installments instead of upfront. Um, now, this is a perfect time to have this conversation because you are in the due diligence phase. You yes. are the secret shopper <laughs> for everybody at this point. And so, you know, I did this a couple of years ago, well, two and a half, three years ago, whatever I implemented it. And then I actually presented a couple, uh, pre did a couple of presentations to some NARPM groups about this preferred tenant program. And so I have a working knowledge of it, but it's kind of antiquated and dated. So where your secret shopper effort is up to the minute. And so what I want you to do is explain a lot of those things in detail, like explain what a surety bond is. Uh, I'm going to have you explain some of the other concepts behind it. You know, what, what billing authorization is. I mean, yep. let's just keep going. So I hated, I didn't want to interrupt you, but I wanted to preface the argument or preface the discussion saying that this is a perfect time for it. So keep going. Yeah. So what I'll do now, I think is dive into some of these details on exactly who are the players in this space and what are the models that they're using. And stop me if I'm getting too down in the weeds here, but I'll kind of start high level. So, so the whole idea to, to provide some background is th there's a feeling among certain folks, including some lawmakers, that security deposits are a barrier to housing for certain groups of people. They feel like it's just too much money up front and it's difficult for some people to come up with those funds. And that's like a barrier to housing and, and people view housing as like the bedrock of stability to help to help folks prosper in society. So that's the uh, that's the premise, which I actually don't know that I fully agree with that premise, but that's the premise. And so the idea is, OK, well, what can we do to to make security deposits go away? Um, and I think the companies that have come out with these solutions, they also have an argument, which is. Well, if you don't require a security deposit, it's going to be easier and faster to lease your, your apartments or your homes. So that's, that's their position as well. <clears throat> so if you're not charging a full month's rent security deposit up front, well, what do they do? Because in my mind, the security deposit, it actually provides two really important functions. The first is the security deposit in and of itself is like a tenant screening. It's part of your tenant screening because if someone can't come up with that full month's rent up front, you kind of wonder about their liquidity and their ability to actually pay the rent over time. So that's actually the first function, which I don't think a lot of people talk about that. It gets forgotten. The second function is to provide some uh, to provide some assurance to the property manager or landlord that the property is going to be returned in good condition and to provide for a way to them, for them to be protected against damages or unpaid rent in the case of an eviction or, or a bad tenant. So 
with that as the backdrop, let's look at what the uh, what the options for security deposit alternatives are. So for decades, there has been an option available. It's called a surety bond. And a surety bond is a special form of insurance, which is actually an, it's an insurance contract between three people. Um, there's the there's the insurance company, there's the person paying the premium, and then there's a the person who's actually the insured. So if you think about a traditional insurance policy, take your, uh, your car insurance, for example. Um, with your car insurance, you are paying the premium and you are also the insured, right? So, so if, you are, if you experience a loss, like a car accident, you can file a claim against your insurance company and be reimbursed. And you're also the same person who's paying the premium, okay? So that's pretty simple. With these surety bond models, the person paying the premium is not the insured. So the tenant pays the premium, but then the landlord is the one who can actually file, file a claim against the insurance company. The thing that's kind of crazy about surety bonds and is true for a lot of these is that although the insurance company is collecting these premiums, if they actually pay out on a loss, if they pay out a claim, they then go after the tenant to be made whole for the amount that they paid out, which is pretty shocking. Um, if you didn't know that because you're thinking, well, it isn't it's insurance. So why would, you know, if I get in a car accident and I experience a loss and I file a claim, the insurance company doesn't then ask to be paid back for the money that they paid out. You know, they may raise premiums, but that's different. So that's pretty shocking. I think when people first learn about that, and that's true for, like I said, for most of these products. So that's a surety bond. And those, those companies have been around forever. Um, there's a sure deposit product, jetty, the guarantors are the other big names right now. Um, some of these are newer and they have like a little spin on it. Like maybe they charge a monthly fee, a smaller monthly fee instead of an upfront fee. Um, but, but in essence, the idea is you pay a fee, uh, that, that basically is an insurance policy against the loss. That way you're not tying up one full month's rent, um, you know, in the form of a traditional security deposit. Okay. So that's, so that, that's let me interrupt you here. Yeah. So I believe that legal term is called subjug, subjugation. And I think that I hope I didn't butcher that. If you know any attorney out there that's listening to me, you're an idiot, Larson. Um, <laughs> I think it's called subjugation. And what it means is uh, you're giving up the right to the insurance company so they can go after the tenant. So the insurance company made the property manager whole, like, okay, property manager, here's yep. $800 or whatever. And then the debt is now the insurance companies. Correct. The insurance company owns the debt and they go after the tenant. Right. Okay. So I wanted to clarify that. So everybody understands that it's not just like the tenant is free and clear and they're gone. Right. Uh, they've been paying the premium. So I can see how that could be a little problematic because the tenant is paying the premium, Yep. but the beneficiary is the property manager. Right. And that, that gets a little, I can see, you could see how that could, uh, some people could not like that if they really dig into it and you could see some, you know, senator saying, "Hey, this is not good. We're going right. to change this, and and you know, we're going to shut this whole industry down." So it's very on the yeah. And I think it's important, like if it's made clear up front to the tenant that that's how it works. That's one thing, but I think a lot of times it's just kind of completely glossed over, and the tenants feel like, "Well, if I'm paying the premium every month or I pay this fee up front, I'm off the hook, um, and the insurance company is going to pay for any damage or unpaid rent." And that's just not the case. And it's actually a really important piece of of how it works, because if the insurance company didn't go after the tenant, um, there would be what's called a moral hazard, which is, it's like a special insurance term, but it basically means um, the person, like the incentives aren't aligned, right? So there's no incentive for the tenant to behave, pay the rent, leave the property in good condition, if then a third party is gonna make the landlord whole and then the tenant just gets away scot-free. It'd kind of be like if someone else was paying your car insurance premiums, you'd have no incentive to like be a good driver, right? Over time. So, so that's a moral hazard, which it's like an insurance. Uh, it's actually a really important part of uh, constructing insurance policies that actually work. Okay. So let's move forward in time a little bit. Um, so that was surety bonds. They've been around forever. So now what's come out? Well, there's a few other companies that have come out with newer products. One of them's called Rhino. Uh, one of them's called Obligo. And there's another one called Lease Lock. These are the three big players right now. Now I'll start with Rhino. They're the most similar to a surety bond. Um, and I should I should mention I spoke with Lease Lock, Obligo, and Rhino for this article that I wrote. I talked with either the, the founders or or 
you know, very high level people in these companies because I wanted to make sure I had all the facts right. So Rhino, um, it's a surety bond, but but it's non-pooled, which is it's, it's like a technical uh, thing with whether or not the, the surety bonds are pooled among all of your properties or whether they're just independently backed. Um, so I guess the idea is that since they're non-pooled, um, it's more of a modern take on the whole thing. So with Rhino, there's no upfront cost to the tenant. It's a monthly fee. Um, and uh, Rhino says that they don't usually go after tenants if there's a claim. So if the landlord makes a claim and uh, Rhino pays it out, um, and then then Rhino says that they don't always necessarily go after the tenants, especially if it's disputed in order to be made whole. Rhino has presented themselves as like the tenant friendly or tenant, like they try to be more on the tenant side, I think, out of these companies. That's that's how they're positioning themselves. Um, okay, so so that's an overview of Rhino. Then you've got Obligo, which, is, which uses a completely different model. Um, Obligo uses something called a billing authorization. Um, their product is not insurance. It's not a surety bond. Essentially what they do is prior to the tenant moving in, they're the ones that actually screen the tenant and they link into their bank accounts and credit cards and they get approval from the tenant that says, hey, if you move out and there's damages or there's, there's unpaid rent, you're signing away and agreeing that we're going to be able to bill you for that. It's just like a hotel. When you go to a hotel and you put your credit card in, you sign a billing authorization and you basically are in advance agreeing, hey, if I use uh, the little uh, liquor bottles or if I smoke in the room, you can charge my credit card for that. Okay, so, so with Obligo, um, that's the model. It's not insurance. It's not a surety bond. Um, it's, I think you pay, I think the tenant pays the first year's premium. It's like, they say not to call it a premium because it's not insurance. They pay that up front, And then after the first year, it's monthly, if I'm remembering that right. Um, and Obligo does have revenue share with the landlord available. Um, and they do go after tenants to be made whole. And they actually have a very high success rate with that because of this prior billing authorization. They've already got the credit cards. They've already got the bank accounts. So they have a very high uh, collections rate, which over the long run should position them well to be financially uh, solvent. There's concerns with some of these other groups about, you know, their venture backed and their, their unit economics aren't profitable yet. Are they ever going to get to a place where they're actually making money? Because these companies come and go. I don't know if you've been following, but, you know, there's been a bunch of companies that have tried this type of thing and they've, they've, a lot of them just, you know, they all, they all talk about how, oh, well, we're backed by, you know, such and such uh, ins insurance company, you know, worldwide, and it sounds great. Well, guess what? Those, those reinsurers, they're, not, they're under no obligation to reissue that policy every year. So these reinsurance companies that back these insurance company, al the, these insurance alternative products, uh, security deposit alternative products, the insurance companies that back them, there is no guarantee they're going to be around forever. Um, so, and that's happened before. So, um, let me pause there. Cause I've been, feel like I've been talking for a while. Is that, is that all making sense? It is. And so I wanted you to dive into the last one. Uh, you mentioned lease lock. Did you talk mm -hmm. through that? So talk yeah. through that. And then from there, I got a couple questions. Go ahead. Okay, great. So, so real quick lease lock, uh, it's a different model. Again, it's lease insurance is what they call it. It's not a surety bond. It's a, it's a pure insurance play. Um, the monthly cost for the tenant can range anywhere around $29 a month. Um, and that will get the landlord about $5,000 in coverage for unpaid rent and damage. Um, they, uh, th they don't, one thing that makes them different is they say that they don't pursue tenants. Uh, it, they say they have the ability to, but they don't pursue tenants for unpaid damages and, and claims that, that the landlord may make. Um, so so lease lock, you know, the other thing that makes them different is their model is opt out. So by default, when you roll out lease lock at your property management company, the language is written into the lease and the tenant has to kind of read that carefully and, and specifically opt out. Otherwise they're in. Um, and I think the idea there is by, it's just like health insurance, where if you got a bunch of sick people and no healthy people, you're not going to be profitable and your premiums are going to skyrocket. The idea is if you get everyone on board, um, the good tenants who are paying the premium and not, and not making claims that kind of balances the whole thing out. 
So if you're interested in all the nitty gritty details, I have a nice table I put together showing an overview of all this. And then of course the article I wrote talks about it as well. Now we posted an article on the Facebook group and then it will also be in the show note links as we publish this a uh, production. So the other side of this is we want to answer the why, okay? The why are we doing this? And so I'm going to paraphrase and imitate a uh, good friend of mine, Robert Gilstrap. And the first thing he's going to say <laughs> is, why, 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 how am I going to make money? How am I going to make money? And that was a pretty butchered imitation of him because uh, he has got that, you know, Southern Georgia, yep. Atlanta draw, and he's a good dude. And Robert Gilstrap was my introduction to NARPM, actually. I, I, we, we probably wouldn't be talking if it wasn't for him because I got connected to him through a software product that we both use called Process Street. The owner of Process Street was like, hey, you should talk to this guy. He's also our customer. He's thinking about you know rolling out Process Street for his property management business. So I got talking to Robert and he's like, hey, are you a member of NARPM? I was like, no. He's like, yeah, you should really join and come out to the broker owner. And this was probably four or five years ago. So got to give a shout out to Robert for that. No, he's always been a, a good dude to have around, especially when it comes to this, because he makes a very solid point. What are the incentives for the property manage, property management company uh, to implement something like this? Now, so a couple of things that we do, and then you can talk on your side, is there is some of these players do have revenue share, so they may yep. be able to share some of what they bring in. There is an opportunity, potentially you charge an upfront fee, uh, and that could be a preferred tenant program fee. That could be a you know, whatever fee you want to name it, that could be a one-time upfront. Uh, we do that at RentWorks. Uh, in addition, there may be an admin fee that could potentially be charged per month to the tenant uh, directly to them. But it gets that gets a little problematic. I mean, because a lot of these programs, the tenant pays the vendor directly. It does not come through the PMC. Like, uh, right. you know, a lot of us are talking about the, the resident benefits package. And then that includes a lot of times uh, any sort of like insurance or, or renter's insurance or master policy or tenant legal liability, all that is going through the property manager directly. And then the property yeah. manager pays for the premium of the insurance. This right. is not so, like so the that. only one that the only one where that's not true is lease lock. So lease lock, um, the billing is handled by the landlord or the property manager, and you can add, you know, a few extra dollars to the monthly fee if you want. Um, because you're collecting it. I think all of the others, Obligo, Rhino, the guarantors, Jetty, Sure Deposit, I think that, that you're right, that they collect it directly from the tenant, which part of me is like, okay, well, thank God, that's just one more thing. I don't have to worry about collecting with the rent. Uh, but I do see your point, which is it makes it a lot harder to bundle with a resident benefit package, but, you know, on the other hand. Yeah, because you could put that in, you know, right into there. And, you know, yeah. as part of the uh, you know, I had a very good discussion the other day online with a, a lady on the Facebook group. And I, uh, ma'am, I forget your name, but I thought it was a great convo we had is she's looking at this from a perspective of both the owner and the landlord, because she's, she owns a home, she manages it and she's a landlord. And she also works for a property management company. Uh, in addition to she's a tenant at where she is. So she's kind of doing everything at once, right? She works for a PMC. She has rental property. And we he had a very good conversation about how to potentially structure this. And a lot of it came down to, well, why should I pay for that? Because over the aggregate of years and years in that home, it adds up to be way more than a security deposit. And so we went back and forth and it was a real good combo. And basically it was like, well, okay, if this were a dollar a year, would it be worth it up front? And to pay that little up front to, to get that benefit versus three, four, five thousand dollars up front to pay a security deposit. You know, it's, right. it's just about finding that price. And so I only mention that because every dollar you tack on to a premium, you know, like in the lease lock format, if you're, you're paying X and then the PMC adds $3 on top of X, you know, you're just getting, you're drifting away from kind of what your intent is. And the intent to, to make a point of the segue is your intent is to eliminate security deposits. That should right. be your whole intent. So making money and eliminating security deposits are like, 50, 50, hand in hand. Uh, and I believe that, you know, at my company, we need to do a better job in eliminating security deposits. And so we're devising some techniques to potentially make that happen. Uh, and so it's, it's a situation to where it ties right into your article. And so uh, what, what I want to talk about now is security deposits Yeah. and why we're so against them, because even in Texas, security deposits are just full of legal landmines for the property manager, for the landlord, and even for the tenant. And it's, it's so easy now. So if a tenant doesn't like their security deposit disposition, 
and they're mad at you about you charging them one, two, three, four, five, six for whatever in the home. Yeah. All they got to do is go file a small claim. They can go file a small claim for like 20 bucks, 50 bucks, whatever the little fee is. And they can have their day in court subject to the property management company under the property code. The landlord or PMC is now subject to triple damages. They call them treble damages and attorney's fees. Yep. So you can be fighting over a hundred bucks and get slapped with a $10,000 bill. You could be yep. fighting over a thousand bucks and be slapped with a $25,000 bill. And so it's just, they know this and they know that, Hey, if I can, you know, cause you a little pain, you're going to set a lot of court really yeah. quick. Uh, and and I, just, I'll tell a story. So in Ohio, it's, it's double damages. And years ago, um, we had a tenant move out. It was, a uh, and he was a law student. And, uh, and by the way, we don't rent to law students anymore or lawyers or paralegals or property managers, actually. Um, that's right on our website, by the way, it's in black and white. Uh, so the tenant moved out. He was a law student. I think he was actually, um, he was like on his way to Yale law school. Okay. So the guy thought he was, guy thought he was pretty, he was a pretty big deal. And so we did our security deposit, you know, uh, disposition. We, you know, analyzed his, his ledger for damages and deducted the deposit. Um, and we mailed him a check, right? He, he ended up getting, I think 75% of his, uh, security deposit back. And what I didn't realize is that by the time I actually got the check out the door, it was about 37 days since he had moved out. And in Ohio, we have 30 days. So I was okay. I was a few days late getting it in the mail. So he gets the, uh, he gets the check and he's like, um, he's like, I, I forget exactly what his argument was, but he was like, this is, you've exceeded the 30 day limit. And he was also negotiating some of the finer points of what we had deducted. And so we actually, we, we, I think we ended up agreeing with him and coming, coming to an, an agreement on the dollar amount that we had withheld, but he was still up in arms about the fact that it was late. And he was asking for, double because in Ohio it's double the amount wrongfully withheld. So he was asking for that. And we were like, no, it's ridiculous. I mean, we we fulfilled the the intent of the law, which is, you know, we got it out to you in a timely fashion. We provided you a breakdown. Here we've not we've nicely negotiated with you. Um and he was like, nope, 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 nope. So it went all the way to court and we we fought it. Uh we took it all away. We refused to settle and we lost. We lost and we had to pay him everything he wanted. Um, it was one of the most painful checks I've ever written in my life. Uh, and so I think that's a good example of, of what you were saying on our call, actually, which is like security deposits are nothing but a headache and a liability for landlords. And so I think more and more, we're going to be looking for ways to, to take that liability off of our books. Yeah. The, the legal technicalities of security deposits is they're just extremely painful. And Robert Gilstrap, to bring him up again, is they have three days in Georgia to get it out the door. Unbelievable. So you can yeah, you can imagine they're like, you know, cheetah drill. They're, they're trying to do cheetah flips, you know, fire drill to get that thing out the door. That's so ridiculous that's, because there's, there's so many things that you're not going to know within three days about. It, yeah, that's it outrageous. Is. And so you can see that a lot of uh, smart landlords and property managers are looking at this law saying, this is stupid. I don't want to deal with this. I got to find a better solution. And so they're looking at these types of, of different players or even doing it in-house to where they can charge the tenant just a little bit up front each month. And at the end, they bill them like a regular outgoing tenant, like a regular hotel would just send them a bill or charge a credit card and or account. And so there's a lot of people looking at those alternatives right now. And it's, it's because of the security deposits. And the other side of this is at these justice to the peace levels, these judges, they don't follow laws. They mm -hmm. really don't. And if you don't believe me, go into court sometime. I've had a judge point at me in court directly while I'm sitting there with my attorney. And he says, I don't care what the law says. You're the property manager. You're the owner. You should be doing this. You should be doing that. I rule in the tenant's favor. Wow. And the bailiffs are like, they're shaking their head. You got to appeal this. You got to appeal this. And my attorney's like, yeah, you can appeal it, but you got to put down a triple, triple bond, you know, over a thousand or $2,000 lawsuit. And I'm, yeah. I'm like, just F it. I wrote the check and was done with it and over with it. But you know, it was like three or 4,000 bucks. It was like just irritating. And again, the judge didn't rule with the Texas property code. It was the law. He just like, nah, I'll do what I want. You know, yeah. good luck fighting it. And so here's my point of all that, you know, yeah, poor, you know, poor me, right. Feel sorry for me, but 
I'm trying to make a point that the, the judges don't follow the law. So if you think, yeah, oh, no, we're right. You know, we're in the right. We did everything we're supposed to do. A judge can say, no, I disagree. And then rule in favor of the tenant. Meantime, how much did it cost you? And how right. much time and effort and angst? Uh, I don't think people know the angst of going through a legal battle. If you have never been deposed, <laughs> go get go get deposed sometime and you'll you'll understand what I'm talking about. It is the most painful thing to be deposed yeah. on camera over a stupid thousand, two thousand dollar security deposit. And they right. want to nickel and dime everything that you did. Well, why didn't you do this? Why didn't you do that? And it's just it's just maddening. So you'll go through that one time and you'll discover. Uh, yeah, because I've, you know, me growing up right through the property management business, I've been on both sides. I've been the uh, aggressor trying to sue crappy property management companies here in town. There's a there's one in particular that I was a tenant at his place and and they completely screwed me over. And my attorney said, yeah, they screwed you over big time and let's go after him. But it cost me to go after him. So I didn't do it. And then I've been on the defensive side of a property management company defending my landlords because don't forget, gang, a security deposit suit is going to drag in your owner and your owner is not going to be real happy with you. Now, yeah. they might be the one punching you to say, no, Peter, go ahead. I'm going to hide behind you. Like you, you, you'd be the first in the door, Peter. I'm going to hide behind you while you get sued. They might be edging you on. They might be stubborn. But at the end of the day, you're going to have to tell people, say, look, you know, let's just settle or let's find a better way, which is what you've been doing with this whole security deposit alternative discussion. Let's find a better way to do this before we're actually told that we have to. Like your city council is coming to you saying you have to now break up a security deposit and do a six month increment if the tenant wants to do that. Right. And so now you're in dead serious considerations of finding a better alternative. So what do you kind of come to at this point? Well, yeah. So, you know, I'm still, I haven't made a decision, you know, and actually once the law goes into effect, I'm probably going to just let it sit for a while and see what happens. And by the way, I'll, I'll mention as well, Zillow, um, makes the local laws very clear to prospective tenants. So if you go on Zillow and you're searching for homes in a jurisdiction like a city or a state that has certain laws around security deposits or around fair housing and tenant screening, um, they will have that listed quite obviously. Um, they'll, you know, on the rental listing, it's not something you have the option to turn off as a landlord or property manager. So you know, that's a whole separate discussion. Zillow is a fascinating company to watch. And of course, there's lots of discussions about Zillow within the real estate industry, both the realtors and the property managers. But but I have a feeling that word's going to get out and tenants are going to start taking advantage of this. And so then I'll see like, okay, maybe it'll be fine. Maybe, maybe the six month installment thing won't be a big deal. Maybe it will. But I'll tell you, I really like um, Obligo. Um, I've talked with the owners there. I've been following that company for quite a while. Um, I think that their approach is, is unique and different and is, is likely to stand the test of time. I think they're the most likely to be around in five or 10 years from now. Um, I'm also very interested in lease lock. Um, the owner, uh, the founder there, uh, Derek has a fascinating article where he dives into the math behind surety bonds. I talk about this a little in my article and he explains why they so frequently fail. Um, essentially, if you look at the average loss ratio on a lease, if you so, so as a property manager, think about every tenant who's ever moved out of your property. Most of them um, probably got uh, at least part of their security deposit back, if not the whole thing. But then some people got none of their security deposit back and actually left owing a balance. So if you take all those and you add them up and you divide them by the total number of leases, the, the data shows that it's somewhere like in the 200 to $500 range is what the average like charge off is. So some are zero, some are 5,000. And if you average it all out, it's like two to $500. So Derek shows in this article, basically like these surety bond companies just frankly are not charging enough to, to actually cover the losses over time. And what happens is it works, it works really well for a while because they collect the premiums up front and they're not paying out the claims until later. Um, and the other, the other factor in there is the, is the collections rate against the tenants. So after these surety bond companies pay out a claim, then they go after the tenants. Well, their collection rates like less than 10% because it's, 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 in, it's infamously difficult to collect from a deadbeat tenant. Um, we've, we've tried it ourselves as property managers, as I'm sure a lot of people have. So, 
so the surety bond model, you know, I'm not interested in, in getting involved with that. I think it's kind of been shown that that, that doesn't work super well. You know, Rhino has a new spin on it. They've, they're, they're venture backed. Um, they're doing a massive uh, uh, marketing and sales effort across the country. Um, I think time will tell if their model is sufficiently different to be uh, profitable on a unit per unit basis. So yeah, lease lock and obligo, I think would be who I'd be looking hard at. Good stuff. So you just basically helped a lot of PMs out there by giving us the players to look at and kind of giving us your, your bottom line for what works in your market and your company. That's very, very good stuff. And I really appreciate it. So let's, let's kind of transition this conversation. I think we beat this pretty good. Unless you got anything, anything else to add on the uh, alternative security deposit plans. What do you think? No, I think I covered it pretty well. Um, I think we hit the highlights. Uh, you know, I, again, I have no financial involvement with any of these companies. I've never used any of them. Um, so I'm, I'm just kind of purely given my own opinion. And I think that take it for what it's worth, because I've never used any of these companies, right? So um, this is what I've been able to gather from from talking with them and doing my own research. But as we all know, you know, <laughs> once you actually start using a, a vendor, you often find out that not everything was as promised. So. so to add to that conversation about the collection side, because, uh, you know, we're seeing our average uh, collection effort at the end for the outgoing tenants to be somewhere between 900 and a thousand bucks, but it's because we don't let them clean. We don't let them paint, right? We, we want the unit. Uh, we've had people try to clean and you know, it's a joke. We've had people try to paint and you know, that's at least patches on the walls. Yeah. And so we just tell them don't clean, don't paint. And so they know that outgoing, they're going to have that charge. It's not a big, not a big, they can pay for it up front if they like, but they know that they're going to get hit with that typically because we tell them to leave a broom clean. Where I'm going with this is, the collection rate is, is scary. If it's a, if it's south of 10%, that's a scary deal. Uh, and the other side is who do you offer this program to? We didn't really talk about that because uh, do you offer this program only to people with X credit score on their application? Do you offer it to everybody? Right? So we're in that same dilemma because we have, uh, we have programs that says that if anybody comes in at below a 615 transunion tenant score, they are in the risk mitigation pool. And it's all on our website. It's all in our screening criteria. It's all in our application process, all up front. So it's nothing that, you know, it's just like, hey, hit or miss. It's all described to them before they ever apply, before they ever see the home. We put it in the MLS and everything. And so if they're north of 615, then they can qualify for a preferred tenant program. And then they go through that screening process there. So if you're nervous about this, you know, on who should qualify, who should not, maybe only you use people with 700 credit score or 750. Or, you know, you try it at 800 or something like that. And so you dip your toe in the water a little bit and only offer it to a certain uh, certain qualification level of renter. And that could be tr credit based. Right. Yeah. And the, fun and the interesting thing about credit, sorry to interrupt you there. Uh, the interesting thing is that sometimes it's not always that accurate because we, we pull our credit score from TransUnion directly from TransUnion and we use rent screener. But then once in a while, the tenant will bring in something from Equifax or Experian that, that differs and so we're kind of like, well, we have to use what we have to use to comply with fair housing. I can't use your credit karma Experian screenshot to give you this, this qualification yeah. because we have to use what we have to use. Yeah, I've got a few things to say about that. So the uh, I'm just taking some notes here, so I make sure I hit everything. Um, so the credit scores thing is interesting. Um, there's People don't realize this, but there's like 50 or 60 different credit scores. It's not like you just have one credit score. Um, every, of course, I think most people are familiar that, that the three different, uh, major credit bureaus each give their own score and they're usually fairly close, but, but those bureaus actually create what they call products, which is essentially a credit score, uh, for different industries. So for the, for the, uh, for the, for the housing industry, they have special products that, that are more geared toward banks and mortgage companies that are uh, the score that comes back is going to be different and more closely correlated with the likelihood of someone paying a mortgage. And they have separate products for car payments. So if you're a car loan company or a bank and you're making car loans, you could buy a product from one of these companies where the score that comes back for a, for a consumer is, is it's a still a credit score. It's a different credit score from what they may see if they go on freecreditreport.com. And again, it's more tightly correlated with how likely that person is to actually make their car payments on time. And so for our industry, TransUnion 
which is who we use as well. And all three of the bureaus actually have special credit scoring products for our industry that are supposed to be more closely correlated with how likely that person is to pay the rent on time. And so that is why the, the discrepancy can exist between, well, the credit score I have from my free credit report.com is different than the one my landlord is showing me. Um, so interesting stuff there. Um, I forget what else I was going to say. Um, well, the credit threshold is a big part. Like, oh, right. Where the do credit you start? Threshold. So, so that's interesting as well. Like, who do you offer this to? Um, there's a, there's a problem that these companies have and all insurance companies have, which is adverse selection. So the idea here is the clearest example of adverse selection is health insurance and they, and it's called health insurance, but it's actually not insurance. It's more like healthcare, but for the purposes of this example, you know, back before health insurance was mandated, the only people who would really take the time to go and buy health insurance on their own, if it wasn't provided by their company was people who are sick, you know? And so what did health insurance companies do to combat this adverse selection problem of only having a pool of people paying premiums who are also sick? Well, they said, we're not accepting people with preexisting conditions because that, you know, at that, at that point, it's not insurance because insurance is, is designed to pay out for unpredictable, highly expensive random events. And if you're coming to me and you already have leukemia, well, there's nothing unpredictable about the fact that you're going to have a lot of bills for the next few years. So what does this mean for, for rental housing? Well, these, these companies that are offering security deposit alternatives, what they don't want is only people signing up who are bad tenants and who are likely to get evicted or not pay the rent or cause damages. What these companies want is everyone to sign up, including hopefully mostly good tenants who are never going to, you know, there's never going to be a claim filed against them. So, you know, what does this mean for us as property managers? Because what do we care about? It's like the unit economics of these, of these security deposit alternative companies. Well, I think it does matter because you want the company you partner with to be financially healthy for the long run. Because imagine what's going to happen if one of these companies goes belly up in 18 months. Now, suddenly you've had all these tenants who have been paying these premiums all this time. And they're saying, well, and now you're turning around saying, well, that company no longer exists. So now I need you to put up a deposit. They're going to be like, get the hell out of here. So you want to partner with a company that actually is, is financially healthy. And I have no knowledge of you know, the financial health of these companies. But I think it's interesting to look at this adverse selection issue because I do know of at least one property manager, a big one, who uses Obligo as their preferred option. So, so they, they guide all tenants through the Obligo signup process. And Obligo, some of these companies, including I think Obligo, do their own underwriting on tenants. So they may not necessarily accept every tenant you send their way. So at least in this example, if I'm remembering the details right, Obligo declines like 10 to 15% of their tenants or something. And so what do they do? They direct those people to Rhino. <laughs> <laughs> so Rhino is getting the worst of the worst uh, tenants signing up from this particular property management company. I mean, that is just an absolute textbook example of adverse selection. Um, you know that the claims rate on those tenants is going to be super, super high if Obligo didn't even want them. So it's interesting to think about sort of the interplay here between which companies are doing their own underwriting, which companies are getting more or less of the good or bad tenants signed up. And what, what does that mean about how we set up our workflows? There's a lot going on there. Yeah, great stuff on that. So let's let's transition into some PM talk, okay? Yeah. So we, we mentioned this in the green room before the show. So give me one thing. I know you've mentioned two or three. Give me one thing you've implemented in the last 12 months that have been, that's been a game changer, dynamic, even just one little thing that you thought has been very productive in the last 12 months of what you've been able to put in your business. Yeah, so... Um, we, we made two big changes at the beginning of, of 2021. And I'll start with one, which is, which is online only payments. Um, now we're pretty, we're pretty, uh, diverse in terms of the types of properties that we manage. We're mostly class B, but we definitely have plenty of class C like legacy. Um, and so I had avoided this for years thinking, well, you know, there's so many people that are still paying with money orders and also checks. Well, I finally got sick of it. And I was like, especially with COVID, it's like, I don't want, I'm sick of people coming in the office. There has to be a way. Well, Buildium has this pay near me option where residents who want to pay with cash can actually go to any CVS. And we have CVS all over Columbus. And they can take the cash 
and pay CVS. And it goes right in through Buildium through this pay near me. And it shows up on their ledger instantly. So once I realized that was an option, we rolled that out uh, toward the second half of 2020. And when 2021 hit January 1, we said no more paper payments, no more money orders, no more checks. You can either pay online using your resident portal, using a, an e-check basically, which is free for the residents, or you can go to CVS, you can pay with cash and it's like three bucks or four bucks um, and you can pay that way. So there was a lot of weeping well, and gnashing of teeth from the well, tenants. Peter. I got to tell you, man, welcome to the modern society. <laughs> yeah, what I know. You, welcome, what, do you think right? of, what do you think of lights and what do you think uh, of I know. running water, right? A, yeah. We're going to do online payments. No, I'm just teasing. I'm giving you a hard time, but yeah, great now, stuff on had, the online payment. Of course, we had had online payments for, for, for since day one for eight years, but we had also allowed people to pay with checks and money orders. And on January 1 of this year, we turned that off. We said, no, we're not accepting. <laughs> you have to go through one of these other options. So that was a big step for us. I know some property managers have done it, uh, but I'm just going to add another chorus to the to the fact that it's possible. You can do it. It'll be fine. You're going to have a couple tenants that are going to whine and complain, of course, but just push through it and maybe make a couple exceptions if you really need to and uh, you, you can get it done. So that's been really good. Yeah, I've seen actually PMs where they charge people more for an in-person payment. Yeah. Uh, that's always a good deterrent. Yeah. Uh, so if you're looking at, at ways to monetize that or at least like incentivize them to pay online, uh, one of the things we actually do at RentWorks is we have a computer right there in the office. So if we have an applicant walks in that they don't have a tablet or phone that they could do an application from, because again, people move into town and you know they don't have anything, might be staying in a hotel. So we put them down in front of our computer in the office and they can do an application online. And if they walk in and say, hey, I need to pay my rent, our front desk team, they will sit them down at the computer and show them how to nice. organize online payments right there in the office. Yeah, it's so, good stuff. So it's never like, hey, go away and then figure out an online payment on your own. They're like, no, grandma, I know you're 75 years old. Let me help you. I'll sit you down at our computer. I'll walk you through how this online payment works. We can even make it to where it's automated every month. So you never have to worry about it again. And yeah. they're so thankful for that. And it's a good way to, to, to provide good service, which is a good point of that. Now, one thing we did, we just recently did is... We put all of our owners on uh, a core, uh, core of property management agreements because we've made changes here and there in the last few years. And so we get, you know, let's say we have a silver plan and the silver plan could have been higher, could have been lower, could have been yep. different. We're and doing so that what too. We, what we did is we uh, put out a notice, you know, last month that, hey, effective one May, everyone's going to be on the same plan. The standard so if plan. On, if you were on a silver before, you're going to be on the new silver. If you're on a, a gold yep. before, you're going to be on the new gold. And yep. so we got a few owners that uh, didn't understand it, but when they look at it as a whole and they made some phone calls in, they're like, oh, I get it. That makes sense because, you know, I'm mm -hmm. really not losing anything. It's just all the kind of the same money, just different being different charged. And so where I'm going with this as a point is one, don't be afraid to implement those things. And two, you would think that owners would come to your office with pitchforks and string you up. Yeah, It, it doesn't happen. You get a phone call from five or 10% of your owners. You explain to them what's going on. And they yep. realize, oh, well, okay, I'm actually being charged less now. Oh, well, that makes sense. Okay, cool. Thanks, everybody. And they're yeah. happy and they go away. But you just got to be prepared that it's not going to be like 90% are going to come charge into your office. and. Keep I'm going to even in. take that one step further. So we're doing the same thing, which is getting all of our owners on our standard plans because we have the exact same scenario. We have all these owners on legacy plans from eight years ago when we didn't have the bronze, silver, gold. So this year, and we've made really good progress so far of getting everyone renewed onto a standard plan. So that's great. I think everyone should do that. <clears throat> you know, I was thinking late last year, I had this, I got one of those, uh, I got a notice of a rate increase for my internet bill. We use a, a local company called Wow. And it was just a classic thing where they raise it 10 or 20 bucks a month. And of course you look and you see that the new subscribers have these special deals where they can get like, you know, cable, internet, and phone for like less than I'm paying. Right. And I, you know, I, I've seen that and thought about that and it's always made me mad. And uh, so I thought about it again and I was like, you know, why do they do that? Why, like, how can this work for them? And the reason it works is because cable and internet and phone service is very sticky. It's a very sticky service. Once you get it set up and you get your stupid router in there and you get your wireless all working and you get your cable box and you know, all the channel numbers and everything. Do you really want to go through the hassle of switching cable and internet companies just to save a few bucks a month? No, you don't. Some people do it, but you know it's the vast minority. Otherwise, these companies wouldn't 
they wouldn't be playing this game. It must be financially working out for them or they wouldn't do it. So then I was like, well, huh, what other businesses do I know of that are extremely sticky and very, very painful to switch away from? Property management. So then I was like, well, what would it look like if we essentially give an introductory rate to new clients and for our existing clients, they actually get a rate increase um, every few years or every year that they're with us, um, which is actually kind of the opposite of my mentality before this was always like, well, we'll give our long-term customers a discount. We'll get we'll grandfather them in. We'll actually raise our public new uh, prices every year to try and keep up with, you know, the market and inflation and everything. But this kind of totally, now I'm like totally flipped and I'm like, no, the new, the new clients, the new property owners, they get the good deal. And our existing customers are actually getting a price increase over what our public pricing page shows. Cause we have our pricing right on our website. So we started that this year. So as everyone's property management comes up for renewal, not only are we getting them on our standard plans, but we're actually, they're getting like an $8 a month per unit increase over what our public new customer pricing is. Because I'm like, you know what? They're, they're obviously happy. And we actually, I'm going to talk about how we know that in a second. We've done, we've set up this NPS scoring. We know they're happy. They're obviously getting a lot of value out of what we're doing. Our prices are up. And so I'm going to increase the price a little bit. And literally nothing has happened. They're just signing it and they don't even care at all because for them, it's like, what's an extra eight bucks a month per unit or whatever. <clears throat> so that's my new thinking is the good price and the introductory rate for the new customers, get them in the door. And because it's a sticky, long, long live type of service, we're going to raise it on our existing clients. You know, not ridiculous. I'm not going to get crazy, but I just think that's, I think that's a logical way to do it for me. Oh, I love it. And one of the things I was going to uh, mention about that is how you do that. And so that's the big question. So a lot of folks have been advising, and this is where I learned it from Todd Breen, is to create an owner's manual, an owner's handbook, if you would. Yep, we have that. And, and you tie your property management agreement into the owner's handbook to where you can update the owner's handbook, update the owner's manual with a 30, 60, 90 day notice. And that's how you can do a rate increase without having to get new signatures. Yeah. And so you do, you just have to go and, and read your PMC, talk with your attorney and see how that's okay in your state. But that's how you do that to where you can send out a notice and just update. Now, the other thing we've done is I always recommended people to do this on the 1st of January every year. So in December, put out your content, put out your videos, put out your changes and an effective one January every year you do something. And the something could be this year we're you know, giving everybody gift certificates, you know, this year we're making all your hopes and dreams come true. And then the, the following year, this year, we're raising everybody's property management rate by X. Yeah. And so you just get them used to policy changes on the 1st of January, every year like versus, versus just like out of the blue policy change. Right. And it, it <clears throat> makes those go over a lot easier. And it's a slower time of year. You know, that December, January timeframe yep. is some somewhat a little bit slower. So if an owner has questions or concerns, you're not running around in the middle of summer trying to answer those. Versus you're sitting in your office trying to stay warm in uh, Columbus, Ohio, That's right. all places. <clears throat> right. All right. Last, last thing on the tid, a tidbit. Give me a book that you have read or listened to in the last few months that has really been an impact for you. Yeah. So I'm going to give a book called The Four Disciplines of Execution. Um, it's a fantastic book. And it talks about, the, the book is really about how to implement organizational change within a company. Um, and the book uh, gives just some awesome ways that you can take and, and make changes within your company that can be difficult. I think we've all had the experience of you go to a conference, you have a great idea, especially if you've got a bigger company, you come back and you share it with the team. You're like, okay, so starting now, um, I'm just going to make up a random example. Every Thursday afternoon, we're going to call, we're going to kind of like divvy up and we're all going to call all of our clients and just check in and see how everything's going. You come back, you're all fired up because you've read about how like engagement leads to higher renewal rates and, and happier customers. So your team's like, yeah, sounds good. So then the first week, it's great. Everyone does it. The second week, well, Jeff, he's got an important meeting. He couldn't be there. The third week you were out on vacation and now it's been 12 weeks. You come back and literally no one is doing it. And you're like, God, what, like this was such a good idea. Like what happened? Well, what happened was you're trying to make changes within an organization that require a behavioral change. 
And the, the book differentiates between certain changes that you make within, in, within an organization he calls stroke of the pen changes. An example of that would be a price increase. Okay. If you, if you increase your application fee on tenants, for example, it literally would take me under 90 seconds to go into, into my property management software, update a number. And now every application that goes out is $60 instead of 50. Um, and those are easy. He calls those. And it's the same thing if you're hiring a vendor or you're switching softwares or you hire a new employee, those are stroke of the pen changes where there's no like organizational behavioral change that needs to happen. It's just, you can just mandate from the top. This is how it's happening now. But these organizational changes that require many different people to make a behavioral change, it, it takes a certain type of focus and effort to make that actually stick. And I won't go into great detail, but the book is all about that and how to make that work and how to make it fun, how to track the results, how to see if it's working, um, how to get your team involved. It's just, it's just a phenomenal book and we've used it within our business. I'll give you an example of how we use it. We drove our Google My Business score from about 3.5 to 4.1 over the course of about six months using the techni techniques and tactics that were outlined in that book. And this is after years and years and years of trying to do that same thing and failing. And it's because something like changing your Google My Business score, there's so many different moving parts and so many different people who have to do sort of uh, difficult tasks that it's, 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 it's so easy to just let it slide to the bottom of your to-do list or your employees to-do list, and then it just never happens. So highly recommend the book. Um, if you want one, actually shoot me an email or, or get in touch with me because the second edition just came out and I think I pre-ordered like 50 copies from the author. He was having some deal. So I'm going to actually be overflowing with these books. Uh, if you want one, I'll send it to you for free. Just get, just get in touch with me. Fantastic, man. That's really cool stuff. I'm going to go download that. I hope he has an audio version because uh, I don't I think it's too do. good, but, but I can listen pretty well. And I like doing that. In the, you know, you drive somewhere in the truck and you listen to it. Yeah. Uh, I like, I like the audio stuff, obviously with podcasts and everything else, man, this has been over the top. Fantastic to talk with you. You have been a fantastic guest. Thank you. We're going to definitely have to get you on more because the content you're putting out is, is, you know, through the moon, right? It's just great stuff. And so as a reminder, I wanted to drop this on everybody is the property manager mastermind conference is coming up at the end of May. We're going to be having it this year in grapevine, which is Dallas at the Gaylord resort, May 20 and 21st. 2021. Visit pmmcon.com to learn more. Again, pmmcon.com to learn more and sign up. Peter, thanks again for coming on. Let's call it good from here. Yeah. And you and I will stay in touch. Okay, my friend. Thank you so Sounds much. Sounds great. Thank you. Need a repair at 2 a.m.? Easy does it. Easy Repair coordinates maintenance and nothing else and takes after hour maintenance calls for property managers working with your property management software so you can see exactly what Easy is doing without leaving your own software. From Las Vegas, Nevada, our full-time maintenance coordinators will dispatch your work orders with vendors from our growing repair vendor network, where available, or we'll use your vendors. Give us a call at 800-488-6032 or visit our website, www.ezrepairhotlinellc.com. Fine Digs makes your leasing process lightning fast and 100% fraud proof straight from the applicant's phone. FindEggs not only instantly verifies income by connecting directly to bank accounts without any documents uploaded, but also uses 3D selfies and facial match technology to perform complete fraud proof bank grade identity verification, allowing property managers to process applications in under an hour. For more information, check out their website at www.findigs.com or reach out to Henson at henson at findigs.com. This has been a podcast episode by propertymanagementproductions.com. Be sure to subscribe to our podcast, leave us feedback, and come back for our next episode.